everyone. It's fantastic that some of you are still here in the second last session of the day. And wow, I mean, this is amazing. Look at this and look at everything that people are building next door. We really are at a time in history when people are building the future and it's so exciting. We've heard about blockchain and GameFi and DeFi and stable coins and decentralized autonomous organizations and the metaverse. And I just want to ask you though, to just stop. Stop for a minute. I want you to shut your eyes and I want you to think about the people who matter to you the most, the people that you love, your families, your children, your children's children. For this world that we're building here, we're building for them. So I want to tell you about why I'm here and why I believe in blockchain. So I'm actually a failure as a crypto investor. In 2010, my son came to me and he said, Mum, they've invented this new digital currency. It's called block uh, Bitcoin. You need to buy some. It was 10 cents. Did I buy any? No. He came back to me in 2016 and he said, Mum, remember when I told you to buy Bitcoin in 2010? Did you buy any? And I said, no. And he said, now listen, Mum, I'm telling you this. Bitcoin is built on blockchain and blockchain's going to change everything. So I thought, oh, I still didn't buy Bitcoin, by the way. But I thought, I better start reading about this blockchain thing. So I started reading about blockchain and it's complicated and it's really tough and it's hard to understand. And decentralization is counterintuitive to everything about the way that we ever grew up. And then one day, I was just sitting there, and I, I worked in international development all that, my life, which means I worked in emerging economies in really deeply troubled, poor areas. And we worked in Indonesia and Banda Aceh after the Boxing Day tsunami. 200,000 people lost their lives in that tsunami. And I was sitting there thinking about it because I'd been up there after the tsunami. And then suddenly I really had an epiphany about why blockchain really mattered. Because what I realized was, it wasn't just that all of these people had been washed away, no one knew who they were. All the identities had been washed away. All the bank records, all the land records, all the health records had been washed away. Then people came in and started trying to send money to the survivors, but no one knew if the money was getting to them. People traffickers came in because it's easy to traffic people when you don't have identities. And I just had this moment when I went, blockchain in a humanitarian crisis, if all of these people had had their identities securely stored on a blockchain in the crowd, linked to their bank records, linked to their land records, linked to their health records, it wouldn't have changed the tragedy of the situation. But it would have made the rebuilding so much easier. And that was this kind of powerful revelation for me. And from that time, what I've spent my time doing is really trying to think about how can blockchain transform society, not just in humanitarian settings, not just with identity, but with supply chain, with agriculture, with healthcare, with financial inclusion, with so many other ways that blockchain can add value, and not just with crypto, but even with DeFi and NFTs and the metaverse, what I try and think about is not how can I make money out of this, but how can this change the lives of people who've been excluded? And we have such an opportunity after the pandemic, because if the pandemic taught us anything, it taught us that this was a pandemic of inequality. It taught us that our economic system didn't really look after people. It taught us that it didn't look after the planet. It taught us that when we come out of this pandemic, we need to build back better. So then I started thinking about, well, look, God, there, they're creating these amazing things, they're coding, they're building these platforms and they're doing NFTs and GayFi and play to earn and the metaverse. What should we be thinking about to make sure that what they're doing is actually going to make this a better place? So I want to talk to you a bit about ethics and think about how we can bake ethics into what we're doing. And ethics are just standards of behaviour that tell us 
what we ought to do, how we ought to act. They're very reasonable things, concern, respect, trustworthiness, compliance with the law, being fair, preventing harm. And digital ethics are not different from conventional ethics, but their potential to have significant consequences or harm at scale is immense. One algorithm makes decisions about millions of people. One mistake can affect the lives of millions of people. So we started to write this book about digital ethics, and I said, yeah, okay, I'll do the one on blockchain. So I want to share, we're at a blockchain conference, so I want to share some of that thinking with you. So let's just think about how we think about blockchain and ethics at the level of the tech stack, at the level of applications and at the level of society. So the tech stack, it's not special to a blockchain stack. When you're building the tech stack, you have to think about, are you looking after people's security, privacy, efficiency, system integrity? Is there some kind of ethical information strategy underpinning what you're doing? Are you sure? Your, the, your people's data is not being on sold to someone else, or there's not vulnerabilities so people can hack and steal that data. At the application level, obviously, we've heard a lot more about it, and you know, crypto kind of people love to hate. And so the sorts of things people love to hate about crypto is around consumer protection, money laundering, criminal abuses, volatility, and tax evasion. And of course, the energy consumption, which has got a lot of uh, concern since leading up to COP. And it's kind of, we love it when we make a lot of money. Maybe we don't mind so much when we lose some, but when you're talking about the poorest of the poor, the people that we're trying to get financially included, these things affect them. If you think about DeFi, it's exciting and people are making a lot of money, but people are also stealing a lot of money. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been stolen from DeFi platforms. And we kind of laughed when Chef Nomi from Sushi Swap took $14 million and ran away. And then we laughed again when he bought it back, but that was someone's money. That was someone's money who'd invested in this platform. Decentralised exchange order books are subject to manipulation. Automated market makers can suffer impermanent loss. Yield farming's full of liquidity risk, technical risk, price risk, and the smart contract might fail. People are talking about trust, but what if the smart contract doesn't do what it's supposed to do? and someone starts siphoning the money out of the DAO. And some of you might have heard the DAO hack, $160 million got siphoned out of the DAO. It was all in the code. They were exploiting a vulnerability of the code, but that was someone's money. So when you've got an, uh, an organisation that's automated and managed by smart contracts, you want to be really sure that those smart contracts are doing their job. But how do you do that? We say, well, people say, do your due diligence. Well, yes, how am I going to do that? Well, you need to get someone to audit the code. Can you audit code? Who here? Put up your hands if you can audit code. Probably, no, can't see any hands. Oh, there might be one hand. And then how do you know that that code audit's done properly? So where is your protection to know that this DAO that you're investing in is actually safe? Often DAOs have weak dispute uh, resolution mechanisms, they're still experimental, there's information asymmetries, often some people hold vastly more tokens than others, so even though people talk about decentralised voting, they're not decentralised. How do you protect consumers in DeFi when it's an organisation that's managed and automated and governed by code? Who do you call? There's no one to call, and is that okay? Is that okay for our future? Is that okay for our kids? And what about at the bigger picture? I mean, we loved it when the Bitcoin guys came in and they said, we're gonna do Bitcoin, F banks, F government, like we're building this new financial system, it's so cool. And, and it's really, it really is cool. But we're kind of sitting here in the middle of this, 
We've got, we've got Bitcoin and El Salvador's taken on Bitcoin. We've got the US Treasury printing money as if it's going out of style. We've got China with their digital yuan who may or may not require that to go into the Belt and Road countries. And we've got the Facebook and the big techs all moving into financial services. And then we have all of these DAOs and all of these token economies here. If that collapses the global economic system, is that a good thing? I don't have an answer to that, but we have to ask that question. If consumers suffer and lose their house or lose their savings because of volatile crypto, is that a good thing? What about now we've got digital money, if you have central bank digital currencies, they can track everything you spend. They can track you, they know what you buy, they know where you go, is that okay? They can surveil persecuted populations. And then what about the middlemen? We love to hate the middlemen. And maybe those really super rich guys on Wall Street, I'm probably okay about hating them. But what about the middleman to the poor farmer in India? You know, he's just a little guy too. He just buys their crops and then takes it and sells it to someone else who takes it further up the chain. Do we really want all those guys to be losing their jobs? We need to just not hate the middleman. We need to think about the consequences of what's happening to the middleman. And then in all of this and in the AR, VR, virtual world, worlds, gaming, metaverse, what about mental health? What about mental health of our children? And in consumer protection, can we think about Equity, human rights, digital exclusion. People talk about democratisation. That means people need to be excluded and need to be excluded in a way that they can participate. Data breaches. Refugee data is now being collected in camps all around the world and as they travel. What if biased algorithms are used to make decisions about their lives? And how do you regulate for consumer protection with DeFi? But what can we do about it? This is not an answer and I don't know the answer. What I want you to do is just stop and think about it and think about we're building the world for our children and we're building the world for our children's children. Maybe we can help coders understand about ethics. Maybe they can encode ethical principles in their algorithms. Maybe there needs to be a professional association for coders. Apparently there isn't one and for software developers that can teach them about ethics. But we can also, we talk about these community-owned economies and all of these communities who are involved in this platform, maybe communities can demand better ethics. And just the last word before I finish, because there's a lot of talk about the metaverse and it's so exciting. And like, honestly, I'm there. I've got an avatar, I'm happening in the metaverse, but I think there's some questions we still don't know about the metaverse. So here's some of them for you to think about. Should it be an open or closed metaverse? Do we really want Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg to have more access to us, to our physical <laughs> responses to stimuli and so forth? Or do we want an open decentralized metaverse? And if we want an open decentralized metaverse, how do we do that? If you're in the metaverse and you create something, who owns it? Should avatars have agency? We have human rights. When you're an avatar, or you've got an avatar and you're dealing with another avatar, it could be another human's avatar, what rights do they have? There's going to be more points, potentially, of failure for your data security, your privacy and your rights in a metaverse? How do you protect consumers? How do you protect people from the physical and uh, mental health impacts of being constantly in a virtual world? What about children? They're gonna be in the metaverse for sure. What do we do to ensure that they're living in a metaverse that's protective and respectful and helps them grow up with the right values? And how do we build an equitable, inclusive, decentralised metaverse and make sure that we maximise the benefits and minimise the harms? Technology is incredibly exciting. Just go next door and you see the thrill in the room. Just look at these screens and the speakers that you've spoken to. It gives us choices. But only ethics tell us which choices are good. We are building the future at a faster pace than has ever happened before. But we, our whole community, are responsible for the things that we make 
and the things that we use. Look forward to 2050 when you're looking back on the world that you've created for your children. Get the ethics right and we will look back without regret. Thank you.